OK, the Hangout is live. Um, we're here to talk about security and authentication. So what's security? It's, it can mean a variety of different things. In general, it means that the bad guys don't get the data or can't do things with your data, and yet the good guys can use the data. The, the most completely secure system that you will ever see is a server that's powered off and unplugged from the internet. Um, but we can't do that. So what do we do instead? Um, there are a variety of levels of security that we'll talk about. There's physical security. Who can get into your data center? Even if you have really good network security and someone walks up to your machine and plugs a crash cart into it and starts typing at it on the command line, there's not much that your well-secured network can do to stop that. Um, software security, which we'll go into a lot of detail on in the application design section at the end of this lesson, um, talking about how does your software allow or disallow people from doing what they should or should. And then there's network security. You can have either active or passive enemies. Someone might just be sitting there listening to all the traffic that goes across the network. Can they do bad things with the information that they've gained? Or someone might act actually step in and pretend to be someone they're not or um, try to take your server down with an attack such as a DDoS like you see on Freenode from time to time. Um, and these require different approaches to them. So yeah, we have a lot of XKCD today, XKCD like security. Um, this one is just that past a certain point, there is not really <laughs> um, anything that a security system can do, but we do our best. So some concepts before we get started. Authentication versus authorization. Authentication is, is this person who they say they are, which is a whole other can, uh, can of words. Authorization is, so if they're that person, is that person allowed to perform this particular action in this particular system? So um, authorization depends on authentication, but authentication itself is not necessarily authorization. I mean, just because I can log into Blackboard doesn't mean that I'm allowed to change my own grade in my class, much as I might like to be able to. Um, so identity is kind of hard. Like, you think it's easy. Oh, yeah, I'm standing here teaching the class, so I'm Emily, right? That, that's pretty obvious. But I might not be. What if I had um, stolen Emily's identity at the beginning of the term and then stepped in and taught this class for the whole term and stuff? So um, there's two different types of identity, um, persistent versus authoritative. A persistent identity is, well, yes, the person standing here at the front of the room is the same person who's been standing at the front of the room most of the other lectures through the term. Authoritative is, can I pull out a student ID card, a driver's license, is the person on this ID issued by someone who we hope knows who I am? Uh, the same as the person standing here. Um, so some pro sometimes you'll care about authoritative identity. Other times you won't. Let's talk about, so if a project maintainer never uses their real name online, but they, they're always the same handle. Um, and they're, they're always that same handle and email address. Can we trust them? Is their is there identity persistent? It's okay to talk at me or <laughs> or nod and stuff, yeah. But is their identity authoritative? No. Yeah, correct. It's not because we don't we don't know who they really are. But they're always the same person, so that's good. Um, what happens if that same if you have some project maintainer that you're working with and their email is at their pool domain, and they lose control of their pool domain for some reason. And so their address changes. Is their identity persistent anymore? No, it's not. And now it's not really authoritative either. So when you're, when you're working with multiple projects or multiple people anywhere outside of um, doing internal stuff for a big corporation where HR handles all of that for you, you're going to run into these concerns. and. Um, pay attention to how others fix them. There's no right answer, I'm sorry, but there are good questions to ask. So some ideas for staying more secure. The principle of least authority says if someone shouldn't have access to a thing, then don't give them access to it. That may sound obvious, but it's, it often makes things more difficult to implement. Um, I don't know how many of you have set up websites on um, OSU's hosting, but their documentation will tell you 
oh yeah, just chmod plus 777, everything in your Apache directory. That'll make your that'll make it work. I mean, yes, this makes it world readable and world writable, and that means that Apache can definitely read it and definitely host it for the world. But was that what you actually wanted to have happen? The easiest solutions are not the most secure. So user and group management. Um, make sure that your users and groups are set up such that nobody just magically gets access to things that they shouldn't have access to. Um, even if, let's say, adding, let's say, giving Apache root on your box so that it can get the things in the root um, that are owned by root. That's a really, really bad idea because then it can get to all of the other things. Um, so uh, pay attention to who has access where. ACLs are access control lists. We talked about them briefly in the lesson on file. Um, an ACL, or access control list, is a per directory. Um, it just adds more detail to user and group management. It says, these people can do exactly these things on these files around here. And so that gives you finer grain control, although they can be difficult to keep up to date if your users and UIDs and group IDs are changing frequently. And go back and review, review your file permissions. Ask, does, does this really need to be world executable, or can it just be group executable if the person who's going to need to execute it is in the right group? Um, this, this also applies to who you give accounts to on what system. If someone can do all of the management that they need to through a web interface, then do you really need to give them SSH access to the box and so forth? So, in terms of system security, keeping unauthorized people out of your boxes, there is a variety of options that you have available. And I'll, I'll get cool links, maybe if I hit F5, maybe if it built. Maybe it didn't build. Oh, well, the slides are updated now. Anyway, so um, as you may have noticed when you were setting up the system view app, a web server has a whole bunch of different ports on it. You'll notice that like SSH connects traditionally port 22. Um, each, um, you were connecting to port 5000 or 5050 for your web server. Um, there are a lot of ports. A lot of ports have traditional purposes. Often you can get what's called security through obscurity by moving something to a different port. Um, that's not security in itself, but moving something to a different port or to a non-traditional port can sometimes reduce the number of bad guys who try to get in through that port and make your error logs a little bit more readable. Um, firewalls, just are a network technique that says, nope, can't get through here, um, and can block traffic from certain areas and can control where can access what. Um, there are a couple of tools out there that you will probably want to have heard of. Um, Nmap is a port scanning tool that goes through and scans all of the ports on a system and looks for any that are open and shouldn't be. Uh, don't use this on systems that aren't yours or that you don't have permission to use it on? Yes, yeah, question? What defines open or not open for a port? Or I mean, how does it help? So if you try to connect to a port, can you connect? Okay, so if you can connect and if you can get in, that port is open. If it's like, no, you can't do that, connection refused, port's closed. Um, so and then to combat tools like Nmap, um, we have a tool called fail to ban which looks through your logs. Um, yeah, Jack, do you have an update on what I said? You might have a better, sorry, more, more clearly the detailed answer. Open if something is listening on that port. SSH was your example for port 22. Mm -hmm. If SSH is listening on that port, that port is open unless there is some like firewall in between. Um, my hosting provider puts my SSH on 7822. That way, only the people on that shared box use 7822. Other people use different ones. That's their way of partitioning and reducing the, the stress. If you wanted to um, not have SSH because you don't need it, I don't know why, then you would close it, and then nobody would be able to use 422. Mm -hmm. So the end map would not report it mm -hmm. because no one would be listening. So I was just okay. wondering that ports are open when something is listening. You should only have things listening if you need them, which is what you would say. Yeah, thank you for clarifying. I'm so what does it mean when it says it's filtered? Sometimes if it, it needs to have other ways to tell it to no face, not just knock on the door. If you're in a dorm room and you're waiting for somebody to come visit you, they might have a certain knock, and so anyone else can knock like the RA and you, you don't answer because you don't want them to come in. Yeah. That, that's <laughs> one way, an example of filtering. Okay, it's, yeah, it's interesting because it'll say open filter. Right. 
because it is mm -hmm. something is listening, but it's not going to tell you anything because you didn't press it. If you're at the right mm -hmm. knock or whatever. It'll, it's like, nope, I'm not home right now. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> yep. So, fail to ban is a tool that looks through your logs for IP addresses which have been doing sketchy things like failing a lot of password requests or um, trying too many different ports or any configuration that you set it up with and then blocks those IPs from talking to your server at all by modifying your firewall rules. This can be nice if somebody's um, persistently bothering your server. Maybe you can even catch them before they find that one port that was open that they could have gotten in, and you can just block them entirely. Um, so yeah, um, there are more attacks than just the ones that we were talking about today. Um, so a zero-day vulnerability, first off, is an attack that isn't known or hasn't been known before. Often, um, most of the time, an attack or a vulnerability will be published, documented, patched, and it was only available to them, to the attacker, because you were using an old version, or you didn't update, or you didn't apply this security patch. We call it zero day, right between when it comes out and, between when, and when the first patch is released. So those are bad. There's not a whole lot you can do against them, except for um, use best practices, and apply patches just as soon as they come out. Um, so social engineering attacks are pretty cool, and they're often, <laughs> they are. They're interesting. They go into psychology rather than into technology. And a lot of the attacks that you'll see people use and that you'll see people actually get compromised by are not technical. They had all of their ports closed. They had their firewalls configured right. They had no injection attacks available in their code. And yet they lose their account to something. Somebody takes over their Twitter handle. Somebody takes over their email account. This is how those happen. Yeah? Do you know which of these was the cause for the Stuxnet attacks? Um, yes, I will, I will point that out when we get there. So um, pretexting is, um, hi there, I'm from your internet service provider, and I just need to confirm a few details about your account so you don't lose service. Um, could you give me the address with which you signed up and, the, um, and your full name and address and date of birth? OK. Hi there, Apple support. I just I lost my iPhone and I need to I need to get into it, but I, I I've got my like full name and address and date of birth, but I don't I don't remember the the account password. Could you just reset that password for me and email me? Yeah, my email address changed. It's now this. This is um, you pretend to be someone else, someone you aren't, in order to fool someone into just handing over the information voluntarily. This is why all of your um, security emails that come out from Onid um, or on the, the OSU mailing list, so like support will never ask you for your password. If support asks you for your password, it's probably for pretexting. Um, phishing is along the lines of pretexting. There's a, that's the support emails. We're missing your password. <laughs> or um, there's any spam that you get that tries to trick you into, into biting and taking that bait and into sending them information. Um, Phishing is great. You can send it out just en masse and see who bites. Um, baiting is pretty neat. Baiting is when you take a piece of hardware and you leave it laying around. Like, let's say, if you find a USB stick just like on a table in Kelly, what are you going to do with it? Anybody, you're walking along, you find a neat USB stick. Well, yep. Turn into the office and help put it in. <laughs> yeah, well, you're smart. Um, I hear a more, a more um, normal student attitude being expressed with, oh, just plug it in, see what's on it. Yeah, no, uh, don't do that. Depending on what code is on it and what system you plug it into, if that system has known vulnerabilities that the code is set to auto-run and exploit, you might have just compromised your system. And I believe it was Stuxnet that um, got passed around by infected USB sticks. Did you ever think about that at a conference when they just leave them out on a you know, table for everybody? Oh, yeah, even conference swag that you pick up from the... Um, from the cool companies. Facebook makes it too. I've seen a Facebook logo for one. I mean, I'm sure it's clean, but yeah. I mean, how know. many how many of you have gone to a career fair and been like, oh, cool, a pair of headphones. Oh, cool, a USB stick from this company. I do that. I do that all the time. Um, yeah. And so, quid pro quo is a form of social engineering where you're like, I gave you something. Now you give me something. Um, there was a study where. Average people in the street, not, not smart college students like yourselves, but just average people like in a uh, subway station somewhere were asked whether they would trade their password for a chocolate bar. And something like 70-some percent of them said yes. 
um, a disturbing percentage of them gave out their password even before they were given the chocolate bar. So don't do this. Don't try this at home. It's bad. It's illegal. It's misuse of computer systems. But don't assume that your users are going to be smart. Um, and then tailgating in physically secured facilities. This is where you wait outside the the, hall, the door. Let's say the residence hall. Oh man, I forgot. I forgot my card. Can't get in. Can you let me in? And they just hold the door for you. Um, or if you if you just kind of like flash a badge that looks more or less right, and be like, oh, thanks for getting the door for me, or you sh show up with your arms full, any of these techniques, um, just tailgate somebody through a door, and it works distressingly often. Um, like how many of you have ever forgotten your key to something and just had someone let you in when they shouldn't necessarily have when you were living in the dorms? Yeah, I see four, five, six hands. It's, it sometimes works just as well in the data centers. It's unfortunate. Um, yeah, another form of pretexting is showing up in like FedEx uniform carrying a package saying, oh, I just need to get up to the boss's office for them to sign for it. So the moral of the story on social engineering is more or less don't trust anybody. And if you're the sysadmin setting up the rules for who gets access to what, keep these attacks in mind um, and see if you can come up with sane default rules that will not lend themselves to exploitation by these. So when we talked about zero-day attacks, this brings up the point that you might find a vulnerability in something. Um, you might discover, oh, hey, this big popular website has a form that I could just inject SQL into and get into their database or something. If you find one of these, the first thing to do is it's a lot like submitting a bug report. There's just a little bit of difference. The first thing you do, test it. Make sure that it's actually a security vulnerability and not you doing something stupid. Like maybe you had your password saved, and so it looks like you log into a site without putting your password in. Go test it on somebody else's system. Make sure it still works. You'll just look silly if you claim that there's a vulnerability where there isn't one. But once you're certain that it is there, um, disclose it privately to whoever built the site and to whoever seems like they're the ones who should fix it. Um, don't publicize it yet because it's good manners and good karma and best practices to um, give them a chance to fix it first so that the bad guys don't uh, find out from you that this vulnerability is there and then use it. Um, give them examples, teach them to duplicate it, give them the minimal case for what you need to duplicate this bug because you, it's basically just a private, um, private bug report. And then give them a while to release a patch before announcing it. Every once in a while they'll just completely ignore it and completely ignore it for months and months, no matter how much you try and contact them. And then, after a while, it can be appropriate to um, to warn them first and then announce it publicly, because sometimes that's the only way of getting them to fix it. Uh, better yet, just offer them code. If it's an open source project, offer them code that fixes it. But not all projects and not all deployments are open source. And some places also have bug bounties, where if you can find and confirm a serious security vulnerability like that, you get a bunch of free money. So that's pretty cool. Um, oh yes. Um, there have there have been some people who found um, poor designs of applications on campus. Um, Lance, may I be slightly more detailed in this? Just don't use names. Okay. So it was discovered at one point that you know how you have to put a pin in? for registration um, when you're registering for classes, well, that's like a six-digit number. Um, that may seem like a big number, but it's pretty trivial to just try every possibility until one lets you in. And things were set up such that that was feasible to do. And so an individual who will not be named wrote a piece of code that does this and then shared it with everybody. and then. Another student used that piece of code to um, get in, in and used it to register for classes without an advising appointment. The advisor asked him how he had registered. And he, um, as a result of the ensuing conversation, it was pointed out to the individual who had writ originally written the code that he really should have followed these best practices <laughs> instead of distributing code that um, exploits it. and. Um, it was, it was a very awkward conversation with the university, an awkward conversation with his university-affiliated employer, which um, did not end well for anybody. So, yes? Yeah. 
does anyone know about the Mitov exploit where people will figure out who they are interning for like a week early? Um, I hadn't actually heard about that, Dave. Yeah, uh, so it wasn't really an exploit. So basically, they just had the file available on the system, and he just went to the directory. They figured mm -hmm. out what the file name was. So it wasn't really an exploit. It was just figuring out what the Still an exploit. So, so speaking of which, there's this cool thing you can do where you just guess what the URL will be. Like, for a lot of Kevin's classes, um, he has his old assignment and homework solutions and quiz solutions posted. If you just turn the current year into a previous year, I pointed this out to him. I sent him an email and I said, Kevin, you know, I can I can engineer your URLs and get to class content. And he was like, Oh, it's my Easter egg for anybody smart enough to you are, uh, to engineer URLs. <laughs> so there you go. There's a freebie. Always try um, looking at previous um, previous years of a given course <laughs> and make sure the professors know if you're using it. But some professors will just leave that there and go, Oh, you were smart. You you get this as a reward, yeah? Yeah. Um, on the Economist website, it like tells you to subscribe if you want to see old comics. But like, I found out thumbnails for the old comics, and then I I just I noticed that like, you could just change part of the name and you see the whole comic. But that mm -hmm. is right. it, It's amazing how often that happens. You really don't know whether, and it's not like a huge security flaw, but you never know whether it's them just being nice to anyone who knows to engineer URLs or them being a little silly. So make sure that you make them aware that that's available. Um, if you want to be thoroughly ethical, yes. Has this gotten people in trouble in the past? It has gotten um, <laughs> what the URL engineering or the um, pins. I've informed the advisors on multiple occasions about the URL thing, and they don't seem to mind. So different departments have different policies. I have a professor that if I pulled that, I would get academic dishonesty charges in 30 seconds. Yeah, she would literally send me straight to the dean, and that's it. So make sure you know. So you're if you if you find that that's available before you take advantage of it, talk to the professor. Go. Did you know that you have this site up here, and that uh, students would be able to access it? I haven't accessed it, but. Here's how you take it down if you want it down. Um, is the is the ethical solution to that? The business department is particularly touchy on these topics, and a lot of the pro school people may be used to the computer science world, which is one you're more mm -hmm. familiar with. So. Yeah, so, so be be very very careful. Like CS profs will more or less know what's going on. A business prof might think that you're a scary hacker for having guessed it. So. Be prepared to be responded to as they respond to a scary hacker. <laughs> Just because you can do it doesn't mean you should. And be mindful of where you are. If you discover some vulnerability in some application on campus, you know, like like Jack said, depending on who it is, they may think that you're a hacker, and you might lose your academic status. So you have to be really careful. I mean, even if you're out in a company, you work with this company, you see this blatant security problem, you know, be careful. I mean, you definitely want to tell them, but you don't want to be the person that goes through and like announces on Reddit, hey, check this out, and then <laughs> exactly, exactly. The ethical thing to do and the um, legal thing to do is make sure that it's really a, a bug, disclose it privately, and give them a chance to fix it, and make sure that they get that chance to fix it before you tell anybody. So, yeah, um, with that, let's continue to passwords. Um, Pono is a um, an OSL sysadmin and a math guy, math major maybe, math physics, something like that, and knows lots about math behind this. So. Yeah, so have people seen this comic before? So this is like, this is a good password, right? It's got alphanumerics, it's even got one symbol that's not a letter or a number. But it turns out that length of passwords ends up being a lot more important because uh, so there's 26 letters in the alphabet, there's 10 numbers, and then you've got about a dozen characters. So that's uh, 52 plus, what, 20? So it's like 72. So for every letter that you have, you raise 72 to that power, and that's how many possible passwords there are that length. So length becomes a much more important characteristic of passwords. That's why they, he's characterizing it as entropy, which is a, an information theoretic term. It means that it's hard to guess. That's basically it. So we like long passwords like this. Um, so passwords are used to authenticate for any system. When you have a username, you want to be able to authenticate to that user, and so you use a password to do that. There are a couple ways that um, you can design your password. So like this is one method. One that I've heard is 
you do this exact same thing, but you remove a random letter from each word, so that makes it more resilient to dictionary attacks. So a dictionary attack is people's memories are very bad, so we tend to use passwords that we can remember. The problem with that is that everybody seems to remember the same kind of thing, so you can design an attack that will specifically target these type of passwords, which is Troubadour and 3. Um, so use random characters if you want. Um, there's a couple utilities. One's called uh, PWGen, um, and so that'll, rent, that'll generate a random password for you of arbitrary length. Um, they're hard to remember, though, so password managers are another thing we're going to talk about. Uh, here's a comic if you're following along, or a quote from Bash. Basically, don't give out your password. That's not a good idea. Um, so you need to keep it uh, private. So like, um, I know a lot of moms keep sticky notes on their computers that have their passwords. And to be honest, I don't think that's a big deal. Like, as long as you don't write the account name right next to it, it's usually not that bad of an idea. Um, oh, we're on the internet. We can. <laughs> I know, right? We can show that. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so that's that's kind of the main idea. Um, so that's from the user's perspective. Um, you need to remember your password, so you, you have to come up with some method to remember it. Now, where it gets more interesting ah, is no. um, what happens on the server side. So to authenticate <laughs> against a server, the server's got to have a list of usernames and passwords, right? So most easily and most trivially, what you're going to want to do is you're just going to have a giant text file that has username space password, or username comma password for a CSV file. So what that means is I'm going to send you some data. It's going to say, comma, my password is really awful. And then once it compares those two, it knows I am who I said I am. Um, Sorry. This is really bad because the problem lies in the fact that if the server gets compromised and that file gets leaked, now every username password combination has been shared to the public. Um, so you can't rely upon the uh, storing stuff in plain text. That's what we say if it's unencrypted. So we need a better method than that. So what we do is there's a, there's, a, there's a mathematical and computer science idea of this function called a hash. What a hash is is it takes strings, and then it sends them to fixed strings of length n. Now, you want to be able to do this really quickly. So uh, the most common hashing algorithm is called MD5. So what it does is you're able to compare a random string, and then it will send it through a one-way function, and you get a, a, a fixed length string. So you can do this with strings, or you can do this with files, because they're just bits, right? Um, the properties of a hash are that it's, uh, um, hashes are one-way functions. So what that means is that given a hash, I'm not able to tell you what the input was to generate that hash. So you want to use a hash to store your passwords. So now the idea is we can store usernames next to the hash of the password, and then I don't send you my password, I send you the hash of my password, and we can compare those two things. That way, if that file or that database gets compromised, they don't know exactly what my password is. But again, there's a problem with this. The problem is that hashes are really fast, and computing hardware is so cheap these days that you can easily generate um, a one-to-one -one correspondence between what inputs match to what outputs for a hash function. Um, there's, uh, it's a slightly outdated idea, but it's a thing called a rainbow table. Um, and it is just a big file that keeps list of what, what inputs go to what through different hash functions. So if you have this file, you can really trivially scan through a list and see what, pe what passwords people are using. Um, so we have a better idea, and that's a hash function that takes really long to compute. Now, the fundamental idea here is that for a proper authentication, that penalty for hashing is minimal. So now when I log in, an extra second for, for my password to hash is a second of correct time for me. But if anybody misses my password and they're inputting the wrong thing, that's a second for every attempt they have to make to check what my password is. This is really good because most, most hashes, you can do 100,000 up to 100 million a second on you know, uh, $100 an hour on EC2. So you really want to have a, a password hash. And bcrypt and scrypt are the most popular two. Um, they have implementations in Python and Ruby. Those are the most well studied. Um, and so those are really good because they take a really long time to compute. The added benefit of these two is that they allow you to increase the amount of time and resources you have to spend in order to perform the hash. This is an awesome feature because as it means that uh, computers get faster, I can just make my hash take arbitrarily long to calculate. So that means that I can scale it with the increase in computing hardware. 
Um, F11. F11? Was that good? Oh, yeah, nice. Full screen tip. I don't, yeah, I knew that. Um, <laughs> all right, so password managers. So we were talking about this a little bit earlier. Um, really good passwords are hard to remember because humans are really bad at memorizing arbitrarily long strings. So use software to do it. Um, the, here are three types. So the top one, um, these work on phones and are cross-platform. Some of them are open source, some of them are not. But basically, you have a master password, and then it'll keep an encrypted database of all of your usernames and passwords. So really cool features about these ones are that they integrate with your web browser super, super well, so that you don't even have to copy-paste your password. You can just click the link. It'll open up your web browser, plop in your username and password, and you're good to go. So that's for the, the first couple. Um, pass is another one. What pass is, it's a command line interface, and it uses a Git repository to keep your passwords. It's very nice if you hang on to the command line, um, and it works really well. I'm dumb, so I just use an encrypted text file. Uh, so dash x just asks you for a key. Vim can use various encryption methods. By default, it uses the Blowfish algorithm, which is, which is a good one. Um, and so I just have to remember a password, and I get into my text file, and nobody else can read it. Um, this website, Diceware, is really neat. Um, it'll, it'll, correct, it'll generate a uh, correct horse battery staple style password for you. All right. Keys. So passwords are great. Keys are better. Um, keys are basically password files. Um, it's nice to be able to keep a physical copy of your, well, a physical, a digital copy of your password um, around on your system. So these can be used for a ton of different things. There's two styles of keys. There's symmetric and asymmetric keys. So a symmetric key is basically um, like a one-time pad. So what happens is I'm going to... Uh, perform an operation with a password, and I'm going to send you that file. You can't unlock it unless you know that exact password. So that's really good, but the only problem is how do I get you that password? So we'll come back to that idea. So asymmetric keys use a different approach. Asymmetric keys have the idea that I have uh, a public key and a private key, and the public key, when things are... Uh, uh, there's two styles, but one, one basic idea is that I can people can sign messages with my public key, and that encrypts the file, and then when I show my private key to that encrypted file, it'll then decrypt it. And it's only my private key that corresponds with that public key that enables me to unlock it. Um, and then Diffie-Hellman uh, is probably the most important result in cryptography ever. Um, these, these, it was three guys and then one guy in the UK that did it at the same time, but they came up with a method to communicate completely in the clear. So, uh, uh, Mallory is the person. There's Alice and Bob and Mallory, and Mallory is malicious, and she sits in between the two of them. And she listens to everything you say. So Mallory can hear everything you say, um, and it doesn't matter. So this is a rough idea um, of how Diffie-Hellman works. So RSA ties in, ties in neatly with this. RSA is the math behind what kind of operations these actually have. Um, but the idea is, is that, uh, like, undoing, separating out paint to its base colors is a really expensive operation and takes an unfathomably long amount of time. So we each have a color, and then we add to our colors, and then we send each other our mixtures, and then we add our private colors, and then we end up with both having the same result. So this is really cool because even if Mallory intercepts every single step of this, she's not able to reconstruct this secret color. Um, so RSA extends this. It's, we don't actually use colors uh, with the map. But R, so RSA uses modular arithmetic to, to achieve this same thing. That's a really good representation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I think Khan Academy, is that the one that has the video? Yeah, yeah so Khan Academy's got a video that, that'll explain this to a much better degree. Yeah. Which parts are sure? Uh, nothing. Nothing secret. They just like, let's pretend we've never met before. And we're just like, okay, let's use yellow as the base color. Okay, now we each pick the secret color, and we go through and do this. Um, so, doesn't that person know part of it or not? Well, if, if Mallory, our attacker in the middle, were to mix the kind of yellowish orangish and the kind of bluish colors, she would get the result of two yellows, a red, and a greenish. And um, you can't divide out one of the yellows. That's really, really hard. Slipping the colors is really hard. So choose a lot. Okay, so RSA, so this is this is the extension of how the math ends up working out. 
Um, so rather than colors, we use uh, we use prime numbers uh, because prime factorization is a really really hard problem. So you choose numbers that are hundreds of digits in length, and it's very very computationally intense to factor them. So primes are very cool. Um, SSH. So uh, you guys have used SSH for vagrant, I think. Is that the only explicit way you guys have used it? Yes. Yes. Okay. So SSH is secure shell. Um, so I need to be able to talk to my server, um, but I don't want people intercepting my passwords and everything else that I'm going to be doing. So I need to be able to communicate with my server in a secure way. So what we do is we use uh, Dippy Hellman and RSA to ex do a shared secret. Now I can communicate with my server and I can run commands there, but nobody's being able to sniff what I'm what I'm sending to my box. Um, so SSH has a couple of options. Um, because it is a shell, it can default to the Unix style of just a username password combination. Um, this is good, but when you have that enabled, what that means is that anybody can try your password because you need to have that enabled so that you can authenticate. The problem then is that any malicious person can then try a billion times to guess your password and you probably have a bad one. So you're going to get cracked. So instead what we do is we use a key. So that was um, the idea before. What it is, it's, it's a, a, a private key. And so then I store my public key on the server. And so what that does is the public key is there. And then I show it my private key, or I show it some representation of the two. And it can authenticate that I'm the person I say I am corresponding to that public key. So what it is is you drop this uh, your public key in the authorized keys folder in your user account in .ssh, and then it's that file. Um, and then that allows you to authenticate to that user over SSH. Um, so your keys can be uh, can have passphrases on them. So what's the point of having a passphrase, and how is that different from just using a password? Well, one really neat thing is that the passphrases can exist independently of the passwords, so that you can actually change your password of the password or of the uh, of your key without changing the integrity of the key itself. So this allows you to update it and share the system. So this is really neat because now I can distribute my public key and I can change my password to all those systems that that key is uh, distributed on without having to do it on those servers. So that's a neat feature. Um, the other really cool thing here is that uh, your the, the file or the keys corresponding and authorized keys can actually be limited. So you can actually limit what uh, programs people can run when they SSH to your box. So for instance, uh, on Android, there's an SSH app called ConnectBot. And so what you can do is you can generate a key in ConnectBot. You can go drop it off on your server or on a flip or um, the shell for Onid. And you, what you can do is you can specify that you're only allowed to run your IRC client, or you're only allowed to run a web browser or your mail client. So this is really neat because then you can have a passwordless SSH key that only has authority to run one application. So it's pretty neat. So then there's a couple other things you can do with SSH. Um, uh, SSH agent is a really big one. So if you're a sysadmin and you're working on a bunch of servers, you need to carry your credentials around with you. It's a non-trivial problem because you don't want to carry around your private key on the, uh, you know, N boxes. So instead what we do is we forward the authentication, and so then we re-authenticate with the previous server where your credentials are stored. So now I can log in from box A to B to C to D, and my credentials from A can be passed on to box E. Um, so you can load your keys when you start up. There are a lot of utilities that are good at this. Um, so right when I enter my password, it'll unlock my keychain, and now it's unlocked into memory, and I can authenticate with SSH with only entering password once. Um, there's a couple other, oh, I should explain what these two commands do. Um, so D is dynamic port forwarding. So this is a cool feature. I use this all the time. Because, uh, so OSU access is way easier to connect to than OSU secure. Um, and so, but the problem is, is that it's uh, not encrypted. So all the data that you send over that is just being sent plain over the wire. So instead what you can do is you can forward uh, port 9,999. This can be an arbitrary port that's not reserved for a root user. Um, and then I can tunnel all my web traffic and any of my uh, non-browser traffic too through port 9,999 over SSH, which is encrypt, and then the data will be sent and done, dealt with uh, on the server. This is really cool because now I don't care what Wi-Fi I connect to because I can just connect to my box, and then from there, I can go wherever. So if you're using uh, HTTPS and also you're on OSU Secure, is that a redundant level of encryption? If you're using so H aside with HTTPS, so one is security from encryption 
from your machine mm -hmm. to that wireless access point, or it's HTTPS is in, in security from your machine to the uh, web server. Mm -hmm. So I mean, hypothetically, would one of them be enough? So the problem, the problem here becomes if I'm if I'm on OSU access, yeah. I'm talking over the wire. So I'm talking plain text to the router. Anybody can forge to be that router. So I have no proof that router is who they say they are. That router could be Emily's computer. <laughs> and now all traffic's going to Emily's laptop and then to, to, to the net. So then there's a slide no. in a couple that talks about a man in the middle attack. Mm -hmm. So now the problem becomes if you're not doing encryption over your uh, internet connection itself, now anybody can propose to be that internet access point. And then they can pretend, and then they can forward your credentials from there. But like Daniel said, one of them is from you to the website. The other one is from you to the router. That's, that's the difference between those two. And so would it be correct to say that a compromised router could man in the middle of your original handshake with the website? Um, in certain circumstances. So, so HTTPS is how you communicate. Um, it's on port 443. and. What do you this think? may be in uh, more detail than we're looking for right oh, now. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Um, all right, this other command is uh, this is a really really neat one. Uh, this is reverse uh, uh, reverse forwarding. Reverse forwarding makes no sense, but so this the idea is basically I'm going to punch a hole in the server that I'm talking to so that I can get back inside the network. Because the problem is I can always SSH outside the network, but I can't always get back in. So what I do is I SSH out, and then I can tunnel back on this port. And now on freshblue.lake, I can come back. I can SSH on port 2022. And because I already have this established SSH connection, the port is open. And now I can come back in through the firewall. This is a very hard problem to solve about how you prevent this from happening. But this is very, very useful if you've got a long-standing job on a computer but firewall access. You can come back in and you can talk to it and check in on it. Just a mouse. Also good if you have like a, a VPS and you want to like not allow internet access to a certain thing like on a website or something, <laughs> then like localhost can access it. Right. Or it yourself and view the page. Yeah. Yeah, so and it, it works the same way like with credentials. If I need to be on a secure place, then I can do it that way rather than having to, you know, open the port to anybody, right? Oh yeah. But yeah, dash capital L, that's that's what that use case is. Oh yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, that's L, sorry. Yeah. Otherwise known as poor man's uh, Poor man's VPN. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, in the late 70s and early 80s, this guy named Phil Zimmerman thought that why should we send everything in the clear over the wire? We have crypto methods that have been around for 10 years. We need to we need to solve this problem. And so he created PGP, pretty good privacy. Um, and this was a method to do asymmetric key encryption for both email and for files. So now you can send encrypted stuff. Uh, on the internet, and you can prove, uh, uh, you can authenticate with those users. The reason this magic card's on here is because until, and I think this is right, until George Bush in 2007, um, giving crypto software to other countries was considered exporting arms. So it was an act of treason. Um, it's insane to think about now, but basically the idea is that if we provide our enemies with the same level of encryption that we're using, we're going to get bombed. Um, so that was overturned, and it's really cute the way they got around it because they, they thought that everybody has a right to crypto software. So what Zimmerman did and what MIT did is there are laws so that exporting books is always fine no matter what's in them for free speech reasons. So they just printed the source code in a book and sold it ever since. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a pretty elegant solution. All right, so GPG, email privacy. Email is sent over the wire completely in the plane. Email is sent over the wire completely in the, in the plane. There is no encryption done on email when, when you send it. Anybody in between the, the, the server you send from and the server that receives it, you can guarantee has a copy of that email. It doesn't matter that you're logging into Gmail over HTTPS and you're doing encryption because every point in between those two email servers is going to have a copy of your mail. This has been a known problem for 30 years, and no one solved it. GPG is the only solution that people are really looking at right now. Um, and you should use GPG, because everybody has a right to privacy, and everybody has a right not to have their mail looked at. But nobody uses GPG. Very, very, very few people use GPG, because it's very confusing to use. 
Um, this is an ongoing problem trying to be solved by some people in the audience. And uh, one of the more interesting uh, uh, ways that uh, it's been solved is they just make browser extensions. So Thunderbird is Mozilla's, I believe, now discontinued um, web, uh, web uh, mail client. Um, yeah, so they might patch, but no longer developed. So you can use it with that. You can use it with MUT. MUT is an email client. Um, it's from the command line. Um, but GBG itself doesn't have a very intuitive interface. So it's a huge hurdle for grandma to be able to encrypt files to send to her grandson when, well, she doesn't have Unix. That's the first thing. Um, yeah. So the other, the other thing that GPG provides is signing. So mostly I've talked about encryption, but there's another really important part about this, and that's just, uh, it goes along with the authentication. I need to be able to send somebody a piece of mail and have them know that it's from me, right? I can't spray my perfume on my email and send it to my lover. Like, that doesn't work with email, so I need to be able to sign my messages with my key so that they know that it's really being sent from me. Um, oh, this reminds me. So uh, Richard Feynman was a physicist, and he was working in Los Alamos, and uh, he was working on the Manhattan Project, so they had to scan everybody's mail to make sure they weren't sending mail to the Russians. And so what he and his wife do is they would just put tons of flour in their envelopes so that when the sensors opened it, it would just go everywhere. So finally they stopped opening them, and they stopped having to put flour in their letters. So that, that's one way to do it. It doesn't work so well with email, though. Um, so GPG can also be used to encrypt files um, because a file you send over the web is you know, basically the same as a file on disk. So here's a couple ways I think I just mentioned. Um, so you can do this encryption and decryption, and GBG will handle your keys. Uh, GBG keys can be added into a key manager. Keychain is a command line utility for Linux. I don't know if it exists on OS X or Windows, um, but it works quite well to load in your SSH um, and GBG keys and manage those all in a nice little command line interface. I have no idea how your slides are. Um, <laughs> sorry. You keep moving the mouse over. Oh, is that the mouse it? needs to be on uh, that screen okay. or the, the focus to be on that screen. Yeah. Um, so real quick, we'll talk about uh, certificates in HTTP. So it was mentioned earlier about, uh, oh, yeah. Before you leave the email, uh, don't some servers allow secure socket layers for uh, some pop servers in SMTP? They do. So it's not that encryption doesn't exist. It's just, just that nobody supports it. And the problem is, if your server is supporting it and somebody else's isn't, it doesn't matter if you've encrypted anything because it's got to be unencrypted for when it gets there. So I can talk to my mail server over an encrypted connection, but that's only for viewing my mail. For sending my mail is a completely different issue. Well, if you send the emails through an authenticated SMTP server that is encrypted, but after it leaves that mail server, it, you can assume that it's not. Okay. Because so like, they can't adhere to a specific ISP. Huh? Are you then assuming that they're not bouncing it somewhere else? No, it's more like this man in the middle thing. You talk to your mail server, he talks to his mail server, but both of you pass through Lance's server. And in order, since Lance is not part of your authentication chain, the only way for it to get between you two is to be in the clear in that text. You look at your mail header, you'll oh, received see by your secure server, received by Lance, received by Pono. That middle step being in the clear is where the NSA will be like, oh, that's awesome. I'm so excited. Well, <laughs> <laughs> but it, 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 another analogy is like you have a letter that you put in your mailbox. Somebody could walk up to your mailbox, take that out, open it up, and see what you wrote. But if you put it in like the US Post Office mailbox, you hope that it's secure enough that it gets to that point. But if somebody robs the, the you know, the or US Postal Service, then they will take it and open up your letter. Or but if that letter had an encrypted message, they can't get it. And that is what we're talking about. What is it protected? Just my password? No, the concept of the email. No, I meant the secure socket. The secure socket is your relationship. Yeah. Up. The key is basically other people can get in your email account. Right. But if you're like, I lost puppies, and photos are like, that's dirty, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> that's between y'all. And if you click that, then we'll never know you're saying puppies. It'll be private. But if you don't encrypt it, then Lance is going to know all about it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to know about it. <laughs> So um, we talked a little bit earlier about ports. So HTTPS is the secure socket layer for HTTP, so it adds a layer of asymmetric encryption to web connections. Um, it's done over port 443, but that does not mean that anything sent over port 443 is encrypted. It's just tradition that uh, Apache uh, uses that port specifically for um, encrypted connections coming in and out. Um, 
so there's this idea of certificate authority. So basically, um, you know that box that comes up that you always hit approve when you go to an HTTPS website and you don't know what it says, but it says let me go to Reddit or what, let me go to something? Yeah. So what that box is saying is that the, the certificate that that web server has doesn't share the same name with the domain you're trying to get to. Most often, what that means is that I own uh, DanielTakamori.net and I own Terabot, but I only have one cert, so I'm using the same cert on both servers. It's probably legit, but you cannot guarantee that because that, uh, that name mismatch that you are having a secure session with the person you think you're talking to. Um, so there's 650 certificate authorities, so that means that only one of the 650 certificate authorities has to approve somebody's certificate. This becomes a very big issue uh, because that means you have to trust 650 corporations that might have other interests than in you. Yeah. I think there like browser extensions now that you can like kind of find doing that. So you have more control over. There are some. The big one is TAC.io, which I had linked. I think I edited it out. Um, and convergence. And the idea with that, they're being written by Moxie Marlin Spike and some of his friends. The idea there is that why should I trust certificate authorities when I know I can trust my friends? Yeah. Exactly. And I trust my friends' friends. Or you're just using them for yourself. So exactly. You so, so the idea there is that let me build my own web of trust. For uh, certs, I rather than having trust. Yeah, I mean, it makes perfect intuitive sense, but we just have to get people to use it, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So here's a command that got totally cut off about how you generate a, a SSL cert, and then you can drop it with your Apache config, and now you can have encrypted communications. Uh, man in the middle. This probably should have come way earlier. Um, so when I'm talking to somebody uh, over the internet, so like Traceroute will tell you every hop that you get from your connection from point A to point B. Um, besides the endpoints, every point in between can be man in the middle. So they're going to be a malicious person. That's Mallory's name. Um, and they're going to listen to everything. They're going to track everything. So you have to assume that everything you're doing is being listened to. So the idea with a man in the middle attack is when I try to talk to Jack, if we don't have a pre-shared secret, somebody in between us is going to forge a secret. And I communicate, OK, so I communicate with Lance. But Lance is communicating with Jack. So I think I'm talking to Jack, but Lance is actually changing everything that I'm saying. So I tell Jack my love of puppies. Lance says I love cats. And now we're having two different conversations, and this is not the, this is not the idea. <laughs> um, Wi-Fi. There's just a couple things I want to mention. So WEP was the first one when Wi-Fi came out. It's very bad. Um, a... a uh, what are they called? Palm Pilot can crack web in about five minutes. Um, you just have to listen to packets. And one of the really funny things in web you can do is you can spoof a packet to disconnect somebody from the from the router. And then you can listen to what their password is when they have to reconnect. <laughs> so that's all it takes. So that's a very, very trivial attack. Um, WPA is a little bit more sophisticated, but still not good enough. All WPA requires is I collect a sufficient amount of packets, and then I can filter out and I can, I can um, extract the password out of this huge collection of packets. It requires 20 minutes of packet listening and a smartphone. That's all you need. Um, WPA2, there's no general attacks on the whole infrastructure, but there is one specific implementation, which is MSChat v2, which I implore you to check what OSU Secure uses sometime. Mm -hmm. um, MSChat v2 is a broken protocol. Um, one big problem with it is that, uh, remember that we said that a hash worked by taking an arbitrarily arbitrarily long string and condensed it. What MSChat v2 does is it breaks down your string and then does two hashes. But once you get one of the hashes, you can forge the other one so it doesn't matter because you know what it has to be. So really what they're doing is only it's, it's half as secure as it needs to be. And it relies upon the strength of the password, not upon the protocol itself. So Wireshark is a really, really cool utility. And uh, I think Emily's maybe been running this the whole time. Oh, I didn't have it listening, but uh, yeah. All right, I was um, going to show somebody's password, but um, sorry, let me just make it show up to the Hangout real quick. Um, so what Wireshark does is it listens to every packet that's being sent on the network you're connected to, so you can just sniff packets out of the air and you can record them. Um, so you can do some pretty interesting things. Somebody's got a DS at me. Um, <laughs> Let's see. Oh, that's Here's that's just stuff I captured earlier. Let's start capturing. Oh yeah, capturing. all right. So here's me and my boss's Game Boys. Uh, there's my laptop's in there somewhere. 
Here we go. Yeah. That's live. So this is all of the packets being sent. Uh, this is why you want to use encryption. Anybody can do this. Listening? Oh, it's, it's, it's already on. It's going from my it's hooked yeah. in my <laughs> antenna across my laptop right here. Even yeah, okay, I do. But it's like you're not actually looking at the connector, you're looking at just it's flying right. through the air. Well, why, why and why don't we double uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the injection? So there's a lot of really, really like nifty attacks you can do with this. Um, you can actually use Wireshark for legitimate purposes. One of the most common is that uh, you need to see what's going wrong in your internet traffic. So like uh, if you're debugging like a media server or something, you can see what's on the network and what packets are being sent. Um, you can also see if you have a, a piece of malware on your machine as well. Yeah, so that's another way. Um, because a really tricky thing that you can do is if you write a good virus, just hide the virus from the process list, right? Yeah. Like, you cover your own tracks, but you can't cover your own tracks, uh, like, physically. So if a malware bot that's on your server is connecting somewhere else, it can hide itself from that system, but it can't hide itself from the network traffic. Cool. OK, do you want your slides back? Yeah, I think there's only one, one more, two more. Um, so then there's a couple really neat programs that uh, you can give a try. Um, so there's. Uh, the big ones are for files. So if you want to back up your files, so how many people use Dropbox? I do. It's not encrypted. Um, you can you can put stuff on uh, Dropbox and they can look at it. So that's kind of a problem if you're putting any kind of personal files on there because then they now have a copy, an unencrypted copy of every piece of uh, software you put there. Um, so one of the project leads of OpenBSD, um, he's a real security conscious guy, and he actually wrote um, Scrypt. Um, he's got this service called Tarsnap, and Tarsnap's a backup service that uses asymmetric keys uh, to do backups. Spider Oak is a, exactly the same as Dropbox, but they will not only let you upload encrypted files, but they'll, they'll help you do encryption, and it supports all that with their client. Or you can be like Jack and I, and you can do rsync over SSH. That's copying a file over SSH. So you leverage SSH's encryption capabilities to, to, to preserve your files. Um, for communications, um, so VPNs, the idea here is that I need to be able to tunnel my traffic over an unsecured, uh, unsecured line, but I want to be able to talk to my network at work, which only I have access to. So that's what VPN software is for. Um, OpenVPN is a common one. Android doesn't support OpenVPN out of the box. I don't know if iOS does. Um, the one that Android does support is OpenSwan, but OpenSwan's only way to use is uh, MS Chat V2, which is a broken protocol. So install the extra OpenVPN thing. Text Secure and Red Phone are really, really cool. So these are new projects to do um, texting, so both SMS and like an IM like service, um, but it'll do encryption. The really neat thing about this is that I can use this on Android as my primary messaging application, but not all my friends have to use encryption. So this makes it a lot easier to use it because you don't, all of your friends don't have to use it. So that's the problem with Facebook chat or uh, WhatsApp or whatever those are. Your friends have to be on those servers. For tech secure, they don't have to be. And Red Phone does the same thing, but just over um, uh, for voice calls. Uh, Tor, Tor is a can of worms, but the, uh, uh, basically you can run a Tor server and yet the, the fundamental problem with internet traffic is that it knows where I am, where I'm going. So what Tor says is, okay, how about instead of that, how about we put everybody's data into a big jumbled mess of servers, so when you come in, you pass to one other guy, and you do this n or n plus one times, and then you spit it out. So just intercepting the traffic in the middle, you're not going to be able to tell who's talking from and to. This is really important, because besides that, all, all other things are signed. Unfortunately, since not very many people use or it almost actually can have the opposite effect. Right, there's like a thousand people using it, so well, clearly well, those thousand dudes are being watched. Yeah, two dudes, one, there's not much to look at, and also if you use it, it's almost like a flag. And the other thing is that and since anybody can run a Tor node, it's been rumored that the NSA runs about 15% of them in Arlington. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, HTTPS Everywhere, this is developed by uh, the EFF. So this uses Tor, and it forces encryption over websites that don't support HTTPS, because not all websites do. So it'll use Tor to get around that, and then it'll decentralize your traffic to that. As far as research utilities, not exploitable <laughs> utilities, uh, these are Metasploit, Beef, Aircraft, and SSL script. So Metasploit is 
This will show you zero days. So this is really nice if you're a sysadmin. You can know and you can keep up to date with what's going wrong. Yeah. I forget about Nessus. Too. Yeah, Nessus and Nmap. There, there are a ton of them. Yeah. These, are, these are the some of the big ones. Um, Beef is the browser exploitation e framework. Um, uh, so this does the same thing, but just for for web browsers. Um, Aircrack is the utility that you should go install on your Android phone because this will let you sniff all the packets and it'll show you how easy it is to crack the APA. Um, and SSL Strip is again written by Moxie Marlin Spike and it's a cool project. Basically, you can man in the middle uh, a connection to HTTPS because the first time you authenticate with an HTTPS server, you have to exchange data. So what ends up happening is uh, Lance is capturing the packets and so now I'm doing the, the asynchronous communication where I'm not talking directly to Jack. So yeah. I think it deserves a mention if you want to have a toy. Uh, EtherCap? Oh, yeah. So EtherCap, along with Wireshark, will, yeah. will do all you want for packet sniffing. Oh, yeah. It does some, does some really neat and stuff. I just want to mention, I don't want to scare <laughs> you from, you know, not diving into security, because I can tell you, if you want to get a job in the industry in the next 20 years, this is the biggest growing industry out there. You will sure get a job if you study security. But my, my, my note is, is like, you know, set up a local environment, play around, learn the basic things, but like, don't do malicious things. Do things Bre break your own locks, don't break other people's locks. Yes. That's that's the point. A lot of these tools are illegal in Germany, too, I think, aren't they? Uh, I think, I mean, they can be used for research purposes, but a lot of, they get a bad rap because a lot of people use them for malicious purposes, so. But they are they are very important tools if you're trying to expose vulnerabilities in your own systems. They're very very valuable. And break your own locks and not other people's locks. Not only because it's bad and illegal to break other people's locks, but because the odds are that they will notice and they will catch you because they are used to people doing this. And just so just don't. <laughs> um, okay, so there is a lot of math that I glossed over. I didn't think that'd be as interesting. If you want to learn more, come talk to me. I really like that. <laughs> Sorry, I was just a, a question about <coughs> setting up sandboxes to play in. Um, is that something that you could do with, say, two or three virtual machines running? Yeah. So you could actually do it on it. Absolutely. They actually, a lot of people will provide stuff to break in if you want to try to play with that and understand why the vulnerabilities exist and how to do them. And people also. will um, provide broken images of virtual machines so that you can exploit those broken virtual oh, machines. Yeah, Honeypots are fun too. It's just kind of the same thing, but for different purposes. Yeah, so Honeypot is basically like uh, you take an unpatched system and you put it on the internet and you see how long it takes to get compromised. A Windows XP machine, I believe, is under two minutes. So like this is insane because that means that like how much traffic must be going around. So. It's worse with going on. <laughs> literally, you couldn't boot it up and get the updates. <laughs> it would just be compromised before it downloaded the updates. I think there's a funny YouTube video out there showing the world's worst hacker trying to, you know, got into the system and trying to find stuff. Yeah. I have to look it up. It cracks you up. Like, he doesn't know basic units commands. <laughs> so, Honeypot's are really cool. You can create your own. Um, you should push e ECS to make their own. That'd be an interesting project. Um, so, there's a ton of math involved in cryptography. Um, the big one is prime, so we leverage the fact that factoring numbers is a very, very hard process and hasn't been solved in general. Um, the basic idea is that the prime factors of the number p and the number p plus 2 are very, very, very different. There's no relation between those two. Um, that's a very hard problem. So number theory is the study of numbers. Um, fields are groups of numbers with operations, and elliptic curves are a set of, op uh, a set of equations. So these are some of the main fields. Um, so this is modular arithmetic, so like, it's the same as uh, uh, XOR. Um, that's the same operation for a base two number system. So like, it works all the same, almost for addition, except for two plus two is different. So these are four, but they end up being wrapping around the zero. And the multiplication goes the same way. So those are a couple of the intro things. It's pretty easy, um, and there's some really neat things. So lastly, um, so Privly.org is a really neat project. So what they're doing is uh, I want to be able to use Facebook, but I don't want Facebook to know what my gender preference is. Um, so what I can do is I can put data that's encrypted on Facebook servers, um, and they can't read it, but my friends can because they have keys. So we host it at the OSL. The research group is very active on campus. Am I wrong? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you all you give Facebook is a link. You don't give them content at all. Okay. 
So it's encrypted link, so it's a link to data on Facebook, but the data is not on Facebook's. Yeah, okay. the other cool thing you can do is you can put like larger documents in, let's say, a tweet. If you tweet a link and then your friend has the browser extension, they can open up that link and it can be anything. It can be way more than 140 characters. So it has a lot of functionality for popular sites. So, yeah, go ahead. Essentially, you can inject any website into any other website. <laughs> Securely. Yes. No, currently is alpha. Yes. <laughs> Don't put real secrets on it. Don't yeah. trust it with real secrets yet. So they've got an IRC channel. You can just hit up their website, and uh, that'd be good. Um, I just wanted to add a personal note. So there's always this thing, why would you use encryption if you have nothing to hide? People have a basic right to be able to communicate in private, and I think that it's very important that everyone have access to software that allows them to communicate in private. Just as I don't expect my mail to be read when I send it to my mom, I don't expect my email to be able to be opened up and listened to anyways. So uh, jeremykuhn.com, this guy is a mathematician and a computer scientist. He's got a bunch of cool writings. Thoughtcrime.org is Moxie Marlin Spike's website. He's got a blog and a bunch of information about the research he's doing with Whisper Systems that develops uh, text here in Red Phone. And Daniel pointed out, I can't have a security talk that doesn't include Bruce Schneier's website, who's the godfather of modern computer security. So that's my spiel. Um, I wanted to mention that um, for those of you interested in wanting to do security stuff, the Privilege Project is a, uh, participating in the Google Summer of Code this, this summer. So um, or I think we're having a open house on it. it March date? 7th, I think? Yes, there have been emails about it. I'll make sure that email gets forwarded to the bootcamp list as well. But yeah, highly recommend you want to you get involved in that as an internship over the summer. Uh, also, events coming up, there's what's called a CTF, or Capture the Flag, happening on the 6th of March. Uh, it's it's a like all day, 10 to 6, Kelly 4107. If you're on the CS Pro or CS Pre mailing list, something went out like a few mm -hmm. days ago. It's put on by Raytheon, I think. They have things at DEF CON and stuff, and they're bringing it here. Um, it's a good thing to get involved with their brochures, say no experience necessary. So um, I'll make sure that gets up to the list as well. Um, no, to, to explain the event, uh, you're basically trying to find like these items or flags using like security things, like hacking systems that they have set up for you know, breaking rate of encryption things. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really awesome, awesome way to learn about more about security and cryptography and stuff like that. Um, yeah. I think I know something. Okay, um, Jack, you're up. I was gonna say, uh, if we have time later, I did post the the world word hacker video in the, uh, the IRC channel's channel. It, it is hilarious. All right, my name is Jack. I am, unlike most of the students here, a food science major, fermentation option. But I have spent longer than most of you been alive working in the computer industry. The last time I took computer science classes was 1995. That being said, I have been paying attention, and I've learned a lot about web application security, and so are you. Who needs to worry about it? Well, the guy who writes the code kind of needs to know a little bit, as we've learned. The mistakes that Pono pointed out can be made by pros as well as amateurs. But all the users also need to know. If you're using your bank's website and they are not secure, move your money. You need to know a little bit about how they work to understand what the vulnerabilities are. What kind of attacks? It's a kind of a small chart, but you can see there are many different flavors of ways to get in trouble with web security. The largest one up here is XSS, which is cross-site script attacks. Next is the information leakage, session management, authentication, and authorization, as was discussed by Emily. And they go on. And we'll be covering everything on that wheel over the rest of my slides. But don't worry, because there are things that you can do. For each of those attacks, there is a way to mitigate or remove the vulnerability from your code if you are careful and lucky. So, oh good. So another XKCD, one that you probably have seen, and that's an example of a mother who likes to torture her school system. What she's done is she's had her child named Robert Drop table students. <laughs> and so <laughs> typing into that little database, what's the kid's name? It's Robert. Da, 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 da. That little string there is an SQL injection attack. SQL is a structured query language, which is used for uh, messing with databases. Normally, 
you only want to see Robert in that name field. That name field is quoted. It starts with a quote inside the software, but Robert's name has another quote which ends the string, ends the statement, and then it starts a brand new statement that the author did not intend. They did not want the student table to be dropped. But it was, and now these people have learned a lesson. Cross-site scripting, which we saw earlier, is very similar. Assume for the moment that I am running a blog website and I invite comments. And Pona says, this is great. Click here for some more information. Don't click there. Well, if you click there, what will happen is your computer, your browser will run a script that Pono has written that takes advantage of the fact that you logged into my blog and may expose your cookie to find out who you really are or some other piece of information that normally you would not want him to have. Similar things happen with cross-site request forgeries, but that's a little more complicated, and Dean will hopefully, I don't know, is that one of the ones on your list, or are you going to be doing the SQL yeah, one? All right, so the cross-site request forgery is more like when you connect to a website and they want to connect to another website, they don't always want you to do that, and I can't explain very well without looking at the code. Remote, site, remote code execution is much easier. That's just like with drop table students. Imagine if it was delete the root user, rm-rf. You probably, they've learned that, right? That's bad. They know? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so it's just as bad as drop table students. You can throw a shell in there depending on what the, what the form is, and Dean has that as well. I'm going to pop up your shell in rm-rf slash. No. Do this. Don't do it. Good. You, you just passed the quizzes on central engineering and the basic batch. <laughs> So what can you do to protect this? What could those school teachers or school professors or school, whoever the heck had to be write, writing that application do to fix it? And the answer is sanitize their inputs. No child is named Robert, quote, close parentheses, <laughs> <laughs> the What should have happened is they say, here is the valid domain of characters and a name. You know, here is A through Z, 0 through 9 if you're crazy, maybe some international characters depending on where you are. Those are valid. At no time is a close parenthesis valid. So that could have been avoided. Um, down here, it's hard to see, are some URLs. This Bobby Table site, named after the comic, tells you exactly how to avoid this attack in like 12 different languages. Whatever you use, they'll help you out. Also, if you use popular frameworks like Django or like Ruby on Rails, this cross-site request forgery is something that is easily fixed. And the software will do all the work for you if you ask. That tells you how to ask. So go there if you use those. But it's not always enough to write good software. You're also using other people's tools, unless, of course, you wrote a web browser. But chance isn't here, so we don't have to worry about it. <laughs> if you're running a web server, somebody out there wearing a black hat is going to play with that and try and find a way to do something bad to it. When they find that, other people are going to find out, and that information is going to get out, and people will take advantage of that vulnerability. The good guys will write software to fix it and make a new release. This is how you stay abreast of these vulnerabilities. The most recent release for Apache is 2.4 point something. This is a list, as of February, of the most popular versions of Apache seen on the net by Netcraft, who's been following this stuff for like 20 plus years. You will notice that at no point will you see 2.4. All of these sites, all these millions and millions and millions of sites, the top 20 versions of Apache are vulnerable. They know. They just haven't fixed it because they're bad. Don't be bad. And they don't even break. There's one small cleavage on this. Depending on, if they're using a distribution like CentOS, it's a long time running version. They don't change the major version. But what they will do is backport the fix into that version. So it still may say a vulnerable version, but the actual fix is kind of fixed in the code itself. So like LTS. Right. Like uh, FreeBSD has a similar thing, but what they would do is they would actually have the new packages name. So you would see 2.4 point whatever. I don't know how Gen 2 does it or Debian with the ancient stuff. I'm not really up to speed. But it's not just the version that matters. Let's say you're smart and you heard that there was a code vulnerability. You got the email and you've updated. You're running 2.4.87 or whatever. But your configuration file hasn't changed since 2.2. This is bad. The configuration file has a lot of tricky things in it. You've seen that in some in vagrant configuration files and other files. You don't understand what's in there. That looks good. They told me it was OK, and they left it in there. 
what if you have the default Apache configuration file? You would have a little uh, thing in there that tells you the server status, which is great if you're diagnosing a problem. It's great if you're trying to break into somebody's system, because then you know the status and all those things. It defaults to on, or at least it did 10 years ago. <laughs> so probably for 10 years ago, half these guys are running with that default config. So check your configuration. Make sure you understand what's in it and what should be in it. And when the version changes, look at the release notes. Don't be these guys. The rest of the problems come down to problems with your design and your implementation. You've gone over authentication and authorization in great detail, which is awesome because it is complicated. Um, but session management is a little harder to understand. How many people here use like websites that let you keep your password, remember me, that kind of stuff? Probably all of you. So you know how that works. It uses cookies and stuff like that. Oh, yeah, that's Jack. I know because I've got this number, and he has that number. And because we have the same number, we're friends. The problem is that they default to not expire, ever. You ever go on a website 15 years later and they still know who you are? That's creepy. Um, it's also bad because let's say you've gotten rid of your computer. You've sold it to a friend who sold it to a friend who you know left it on the street for someone to pick up. Who knows where their hard drive's gone? Who knows who's now getting into your websites from 15 years ago, talking about your ex-girlfriends or whatever? Yes? Um, you're going to talk about it later, I think. But um, encrypt your hard drives, because everything that's stored on the disk then can't be read. There are costs, and the costs of that. And I actually yes. personally don't cover it, because it's not specifically a web thing. But uh, actually I actually had a conversation about 10 minutes ago about encrypting a hard drive. Should you or shouldn't you? There are pros and there are cons. Actually, Linux Users Group next week, um, Tuesday, 6 p.m., we're having a talk on how to do full disk encryption oh, and the pros and cons of it. So if you are interested in encrypting your hard drives, come to that. Um, and let's continue with the web app stuff. All right. So back to um, information leakage, which, as you saw, was the number two thing. Let's say you're planning a surprise party for your friend, and it's next Friday night, and your friend says, do you have any plans for next Friday night? And you say, yeah, but I can't tell you. So they now know something's up. When they come to you at the party and say, I knew there was a party because I knew you were busy and it was my birthday and you're my friend and you wouldn't be busy on my birthday, you just leaked information. <laughs> now, in a computer version of that, let's say you're writing a replacement for some OSU software that has login and password stuff and you have a different error message for whether the username exists or not. If it says, no such user or that password doesn't match, you've also leaked information. Now people can figure out whether a username is valid. That same thing is a um, directory access, which is a kind of a more specific thing. There is a way to look at who is actually on campus, even if their directory is hidden, by trying to look for them. It sounds kind of silly, but that's it there because they don't actually filter out there is no such user versus we can't tell you that question. So this is where Dean comes up and gives a demonstration. Some of the vulnerabilities we talked about are actually, uh, he added them into the system view app that you guys are using. And uh, Emily and Dean will hopefully tell you guys how to get to that software. Um. <laughs> See if that's running. Is that running? Um, Are we in do I have the app running? Again? Let me. I let me just fire up the app real quick. Oh, so gonna... I've checked out the bad security branch. Yep. And now I'm running the app. And now I'm here is our system view app. Um, and and it's showing up on the screen on the feed. We're good. Okay. So your stuff's going to be showing up over here because I'm dual screening like that. Yeah, no problem. All right. Um, so what we're going to be showing off today is uh, SQL injection, um, which is what you was talking about before. That was the little bobby tables thing you saw. Um, remote code execution. So that's running code on the host machine that you have your uh, like server on, server running on, and a uh, cross-site scripting attack. So uh, we'll start off with the SQL. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. And we're just going to show, actually, we're going to save this one for last because <laughs> 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 I don't want to deal with that. Um, all right, I'm going to show you the remote code exploit first. Um, and then I can show you guys why this is all happening and how we can fix it and whatnot. Oh. Oh, no. There. Yeah, 
Okay, so we'll run this first. Okay, yeah, so we didn't get any errors or anything. And it's like, oh, we found a process that says nonsense. Okay, well, that's kind of weird. Um, and, okay. All right, if we look here. Um, is this in the VM? These are both, or is this one in the yes, VM? This is in the VM. Um, shall I put that on screen so they can see it? Sure, one. I think it's here. Yeah, yeah this go. Mm -hmm. So, that is three over there. Uh, now I want to put in three. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. So that I can. Um, And then um, let's see if that's actually broadcasting. That is not actually broadcasting. Um, it. Let's just screen share everything for now. Okay. Pardon the recursive screen share, but there's not much I can do about that. So. There we go. Okay. Cool. Um. Whatever. Okay. What was it on? Is it on um, five? You're over here. Um, you're on eight. Oh, it's over here. Okay. So that they can see it. Now, now if you type, it'll show up there. Okay, cool. So um, as you saw before, I don't want to switch to Windows again. Um, we catted the contents of etc. slash password, which has passwords for your system, into a file called text. Um, yeah. yeah, test, whatever. Uh, we look at test. We have everything that was here. So, for example, if we were to use um, a utility called Mail, uh, we could have mailed all these passwords up to me or something. And now the now the hacker, whoever um, uses this exploit, has all the passwords for your system. Or, yeah, okay. Um, so that's bad, obviously, and we don't want that. So back to the app. Yes. Uh, we'll uh, wait, that's Wireshark. Um. Cool. All right, and then we can show it. It's the other one, XSS. Okay, I'll show off the XSS real quick. Now it should be whenever we reload the page. Yeah. Oh, that's something else. Just mm. as good. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so yeah, if I can mouse mice are hard. This is why I use a command line. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so if we were to, if we can just go to slash, if we just go to uh, localhost colon argument. Port 5000. Um, let's get rid of the slash box at the top. Six letters. Yeah. So and then every time we reload the page, we get the same pop-up. Exactly. So it's running this code every time you uh, reload the page. This can be a problem because on other people's browsers, you could be sending off the cookies to a remote location, um, which you don't want to do because they're supposed to be private. Cookies are down. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Okay, we'll show off the SQL one as well, but this, this site can go down, or this site won't work after that uh, with what we're doing. Thank goodness for Vagrant Destroy and Recreate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so this is. Yeah. <laughs> so now our database is gone. Um, you could have done. <laughs> You could have done other things like grab all the grab all of it and put it somewhere. You know, you could have done anything, but we just decided we were going to destroy our database because we're malicious and we're evil. Um, so yeah, that was what we decided to do. Do you want to pull up the code real quick? Sure. Um, and note also that there were a few things that he had to know to make this happen. Um, he had to know the name of the database. He had to know the names of the tables, that kind of thing. 
that information can be leaked to other places, or you can just get it from social engineering. Hey, Dean, that, that's a really cool site you made. Like, how did you do that SQL thing? Like, like what database did you use? You know? If, if you're good at social skills, unlike me, you can very easily get somebody to tell you that kind of stuff. So did you like um, have to change something with um, to lock me, or were you using? Yeah, no, uh, we 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 changed a few things. We uh, botched the project. Yeah, the fix is to switch back to develop. So. No, no, it isn't. The fix is to like actually fix the thing. So right. if you um, if you're in your VM and at the app and you are looking at the slides, it will have showed you how to check out it. Uh, get check out is it dash. TV. Um, uh, yes. Yeah, just check out that TV, and then the branch name is security dash bad, mm -hmm. and then you get whole origin security bad, and you're magically up to date. And then when you run your app, it will be the bad security version. So. All right. Um. So I'll go over the remote code uh, execution uh, first. Um. Based up here, where you're seeing the ps uh, grep. Um. That's taking all all the processes that are running. And then uh, we're using grep because we're trying to show off um, all the processes that are there, right? Um, this specifically is just seeing if it exists in the database. If we, if they would have been doing it down here, where, if they would have done it a little more down here, um, like looked or when they're creating them, or oh, never mind. Sorry, I'm thinking of SQL. Um, anyways, uh, so right here, if um, we, since it's just prepping for something, if we put a semicolon at the end, um, we end that statement, and now we can execute whatever we want. So that's bad, and that's why it's important to sanitize your So sense. we're executing arbitrary that mm -hmm. here. Um, and this is also why in the original app design, you were chilling out much more specifically and not just executing random mm -hmm. inputs from the web. Because this is what happens when you do. <laughs> exactly. You shouldn't ever really be um, without without making sure that your input is invalid, you don't ever want to execute something that someone sends you blindly. Um, that's really where a lot of code goes wrong, really. Um, is that why the sub process documentation has to be important not shelly? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, exactly. Um, all right, so yeah, that's the remote code um, execution exploit. Now we'll go down to the. All right. Um, so right here. This is just doing a raw SQL query, so this is more or less it. Uh, when you're using an ORM like SQL, I think we've talked about this before, um, it does a lot of the sanitation and whatnot for you, but for purposes of the demo, uh, we're literally taking, uh, we're just doing a raw SQL query and embedding in exactly what uh, the user put in on the site. Um, so we're saying, this is just to check to see whether or not a search term exists. Um, we're just saying select star from searches where uh, the term is equal to whatever, whatever the person entered. Um, it, should, it should be showing both. Um, Sorry, it's showing the other one to the right, isn't it? No. Uh, uh, I can still keep going. Over. Yeah, keep okay. going. All right, yeah. Um, so yeah, basically this is just uh, executing whatever's in right here. So when we, um, if, as you see right here, we have this. Uh, little uh, quotation mark. If you send in another quotation mark and then use a semicolon, it'll end that statement, and now we can execute our true uh, code on the SQL server. Um, if this would have been what we were doing for actually showing all the processes, uh, which is how a lot of stuff happens, so like, let's say you want to see all the users um, in a database, or maybe see all the listings for a search term, um, uh, it'll like do a select statement, it'll show everything from that select statement. Uh, now, you're able to like Basically, what you can do is you can query for all of the users, or you can query another table on top of what you already had. So instead of just executing stuff, you're able to actually see like all the tables that exist on the database. They have a database on the database with permissions that are set up properly. Um, but it gives you a huge amount of access if you're able to do this, um, not just to the database, but just see uh, small th or seeing user data in there too. It should be formatted in that, not plus it. Yes. <laughs> Um, or just using the RM. Uh, yes, using yeah. the RM is yeah. the best way to go about this. <laughs> um, right. Okay. And then we'll show off the. Um, your your screen is over there. <laughs> yeah. No. Okay. I have to. I'm looking at the keyboard. You know, I, don't know so I had to work really hard to add these because the software now works really hard to help you not make these mistakes. Well, Python software. 
Well, some do. Other other <laughs> folks are different. Ruby has ways to protect you from hurting yourself. And stuff. Yeah. Oh, Generally, yeah, the more mature a framework gets, yeah, the better security it will have built in. Um, so one thing, like where you'll the the most common place you run into this is where uh, you're using PHP uh, without a, using any kind of framework or whatnot, because it's it's not sanitizing any of your input. So if you're doing a raw statement, just saying, oh well, they wanted to search for this thing, so let's just search for it. Well, you're gonna run into issues, and you're not gonna have a good time. Um, the guy from Mount Gox, that Bitcoin thing, mm -hmm. he wrote his own SSH server in PHP, oh. and uh, that's. <laughs> That's part of the reason that website. That's like, what else is fun is uh, going, going on to GitHub and doing specific searches for vulnerable code on uh -huh. GitHub. Yeah. That'll save you a lot of time. If by fun you mean depressing, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it, it's really fun to look at how much smarter you are than everyone else. So. <laughs> right, searching for committed keys. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so. Again, uh, Flask already has some of this stuff built into where it'll sanitize your inputs for you. Um, so what I had to do is add this auto escape false. And basically what it does in the templating engine is it takes um, takes any kind of input that you're sending in from your server and when it's rendering, it escapes everything so it doesn't execute any of the script code that I put in, for example. Uh, what this auto escape does is it gets rid of that so we can show what would happen if someone, for example, didn't have something that automatically did this for them. Um, and yeah, basically, uh, we're embedding this stuff into a button, but all this code is ran when you um, when you uh, load the page. So if, if we embed script tags in there and we link to some external script um, that we don't have to write it out all out in the input field, uh, we can do some crazy magic and stuff is bad. So <laughs> yeah, that's kind of how it works. Are there any questions about any of how any of that works? What's that file? This is uh, proc search dot uh, html. Oh, I do. It's a different part of the file, yeah. Yeah. No questions? All right. Questions, comments, concerns? OK, so now we have half an hour for you guys to fire up your DMs, um, check out the vulnerable branch, and duplicate those vulnerabilities in the bad side. Um, you can find other arbitrary code to execute, make different things up, look for other vulnerabilities, and uh, we will be here to help and advise you. Bonus points, you can fix the vulnerabilities without going back to the developer branch. <laughs> Thank you.